Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me today. I thought in preparation for season seven of Game of Thrones, the TV show on HBO, I thought I would do a series of episodes on Game of Thrones. I've already done one on Cersei earlier, and a year or two ago I did episodes on Joffrey and Ramsay. And so today I thought I would do an episode on Sandor Clegane, otherwise known as the Hound. Many a, many people, many a people have asked me to do an episode on the Hound, so here we go. I'm going to do a deep dive on him, his history before the books and the TV show start, also his story once the books begin and the TV show begins. And I will analyze his personality as we go because I think he has a lot of interesting twists and turns in his history and his story that can inform us as to why he was the way that he was. And he was actually a very complex character. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a professor and I'm a therapist and I'm also a Game of Thrones nerd. All right, so this is a massive spoiler episode. I'm going to talk all the way through to the end of season six of the TV show and the end of book five uh, of A Song of Ice and Fire. So if you don't want that to be spoiled, don't listen to this. Go out and read the books and or watch the TV show and then come back here. All right, Sandor Clegane, otherwise known as the Hound. Sandor Sandor Clegane is a member of House Clegane, which is a a very close house to Casterly Rock, which is near the west coast of Westeros. He is he is the younger brother of the current head of the household, Sir Gregor Cle- Clegane, or the mountain that rides. He's five years older. Gregor is, the mountain is five years older than the hound. And both the mountain and the hound are considered to be two of the most fierce and dangerous fighters in Westeros. The reason why he is nicknamed the Hound is partially because he's fierce like a hound, and he's also unquestioningly obedient to his masters like a dog would be. And Clegane, the house symbol, is three dogs, so that's another reason why he's called the Hound. He is a large man. He's six foot six, same as the actor who plays him on TV. But he's not as big as his brother. His brother in the books is eight feet tall. And they sort of try to portray this in the TV show. But just imagine, I mean, I think the tallest, at eight feet, that's that's a tall dude. <laughs> and large, right? So he's like just mammoth, com- you know, compared. But, but the hound, Sandor, is large himself. But he's not as wide. He's He's more mobile than the mountain is. And he often wears a helm that looks like a dog. And they portray this in the TV show pretty well. All right. So where does his life begin? Well, in the year 2070, he's born. And uh, again, he is born into the Clegane household. And he has an older brother who's five years older. And it's assumed that his older brother, Gregor, abused him throughout his life. And one particular moment that Gregor abused Sander was his older brother threw away a toy. So Gregor's like, ah, I'm done with this toy. And then Sandor, little Sandor, finds this toy and starts playing with it because he figured his older brother no longer wanted it. But then Gregor the older brother saw his younger brother playing with his old toy and he got angry and he grabbed Sandor's head and smashed his face into a a fire, a a burning uh, brazier. And this, it, it was no just minor burn. It wasn't just like blisters. He burned part of his face off and for the rest of his life, the left side of his face is described as being slick and black, and it's, you know, pocked with craters and has deep cracks, and, and it oozes red pus all the time, and his jawbone is actually exposed. 
So he he burnt this boy, his younger brother, so badly that his flesh was burnt off and never returned. So just imagine what that looks like, that you can see his jawbone. And his ear was burnt off, and there's just a hole sitting there. They didn't. They don't portray this in the TV show, thank God, because it would be nasty. But uh, just know that in the books, it's a lot worse. It's pretty bad in the TV show, but in the books, it's just you know her- her- horrendous. So this uh, experience for for little Sander re- probably was traumatic in all likelihood, right? And probably resulted in PTSD, which results in him being afraid of fire throughout his entire life. And he had a massive hatred for his older brother, which we could see as justified. His father, we should mention, Gregor and Sander's father, covered up the shame of the mountain's brutality by telling others that Sander's bed caught on fire and that's how he burnt his face. And so it was a big secret. And they don't portray this in the TV show well enough, but it was extremely secret in terms of why Gregor's face was deformed. Everyone thought it was because he got his bed caught on fire as a child, but to a very small set of people, uh, they knew the real truth, which was that Gregor burnt his his face. So just imagine this one for a second, and you're, you're a young boy, your brother purposely burns your face and almost kills you. It's one thing to say, push your younger brother into a fire, which would be terrible. But it's another thing to gr- to grab. I mean, if if the mountain is eight foot, eight feet tall as an adult, imagine him as a younger boy. He was probably quite large then too. And just imagine your older brother grabbing your head and sticking it into a fire and holding it there long enough to melt your face off. That would be just terrible. And then your father tells everyone that it was just an accident and that you might be to blame because it was your fu- your bed that caught on fire. And as a young person, your face is burnt. Half of it's burnt off, which I'm just assuming was not attractive to other people and other people probably ran away from him. No one wants to be your friend. No girl wants to hang out with you. You're alone for the rest of your life all because your brother was upset that you were playing with one of his old toys that he threw away. It just you just imagine what that would do to your to your development and the way that you considered attachments because this again it wasn't a bully at school. This is your older brother who's supposed to have your back. And then presumably you you blame your parents for not uh, supporting you or trying to save you or anything. So this is the early childhood environment in which Sanders' personality developed. Again, we can assume that Gregor was a constant threat to Sander, not just in this particular situation. And we can assume that Gregor regularly abused Sander without anyone you know, there to help him. So Sander is in a constant uh, you know, place of fear of being harmed or even killed by a sadistic and aggressive, humongous older brother. So what does Sander do? Well, he learns that he has to be quiet. He can't talk. He needs to be silent so that he doesn't bother his older brother. And he learns how to obey orders to stay out of trouble. He's very good at obeying orders in the beginning of the, of the storyline of the book anyway. But deep down, he hates everyone, which is justified because no one was there to help him as a child. And he learns that he has to stuff his feelings, his feelings of fear and his feelings of trauma reactions and his feelings of pain and anger. And he learns to avoid relationships with other people. Okay, so let's just keep that in mind as we move forward in the story. Now, another uh, bit of his childhood that we could talk about is, it's not clear, but in the books, it's rumored that Sander and Gregor had a sister who died mysteriously. And it's rumored also that Gregor killed this this sister for whatever reason. So, but either way, this would have been rough for him to have a sister and then to have her die. And maybe this is why he the two people he bonded with in the story were both 
little girls, Arya and Sansa, but more on that later. Okay, so the normal uh, career or life for someone in Sanders' position is to become a knight. He is uh, a up-and-coming person in a somewhat well-known house, one of the lesser houses near Casterly Rock for the Lannisters. And the normal track would be to try to become a knight, and and that's that, and that's how you get your fame, and that's how you maybe even make money, and that's how you get your honor and all that kind of stuff. And his older brother Gregor definitely followed in that path. His brother was knighted by Prince Rhaegar Targaryen. This is before Robert's rebellion. When this happened, Sandor became extremely disillusioned about what it meant to be a knight. So as a child, Sandor's like, oh, I'm going to be a knight. I'm going to be Sir. I'm going to be Sir Sandor. It sounds great. And then his, then the prince, uh, Prince Rhaegar, knights Gregor. And Sandor's like, you're, knight- you're knighting that guy? <laughs> I thought that knights were good and chivalrous and honorable and but my brother is dishonorable and sadistic, and he's a terrible human being. He's like the worst person on the planet, as far as I can tell. And Prince Rhaegar made him a knight. So from that day forward, Sandor refused to be knighted, even though he could have been a knight if he wanted, presumably. So this is a major turning point in his life. Instead of taking the typical road of working your way up the ladder in society, he decided to reject all of it. He decided he would concentrate on duty, but also on killing. <laughs> he, he said, you know, killing is the sweetest thing or something. Another thing we can say about Sanders' personality development is that according to birth order research, later born children, meaning that they're not the firstborn, later born children sometimes find their identity by choosing a different path from their older siblings, particularly if the children are not given enough attachment security. The theory goes that if you deny children attachment security, they might resort to behaving within a very narrow set of behaviors, so they stick out as like the star or the bad apple or the scapegoat or the smart one or the athletic one or the funny one or the the cute one. And later borns, as their personality is developing, they look for new niches to fill. So that they can get love and attention for that particular set of behaviors and identities. So, for instance, you have a family with parents that are struggling with one thing or another, and they're not able to give the children enough attachment. The whole idea is is that if you give kids enough attachment security, they don't need to specialize in terms of their identities. They they're just they have more flexibility and and they can be more well rounded in their personality. But if you deny children that security, the children might resort to, okay, I, you know, the siblings sort of unconsciously decide that they're going to gravitate toward their own camp of identities and behaviors. And so if the firstborn child, for whatever reason, identifies as the conservative good kid, the one who gets good grades, the one who's good at sports, then The next child in line, again, if they're denied attachment security, will decide that they're not, they're going to be bad and they're going to be bad at school and they're going to be bad at at sports and that sort of thing. It sounds funny, but it's shown a lot when you actually look at family systems. And the idea goes is that every child wants attention. And if they don't get enough proper attachment security and proper love and proper attention, then they will get attention one way or the other, and sometimes kids will get attention through bad behavior. And so since Gregor had already established himself as the sadistic knight, Sandor was going to be the anti-knight, you know, the, the, whatever the opposite of the knight is. Not, not a, a bandit or a, or a criminal, but sort of the anti-knight, and I think that's exactly what the Hound became. Okay, so now we're at the point of the Hound or Sandor Clegane being age 12. And this is when Robert's Rebellion happens. And during this time, 
uh, Sandor is a part of the Lannisters' men. So because House Clegane is actually really close to the Lannister house, it would make sense that they would be uh, that they would you know, be they would pledge fealty to the Lannisters. And so when Tywin tricked the Mad King into thinking that Tywin was coming to save the Mad King from Robert and Eddard, Tywin instead decided to sack the city to show his uh, allegiance to King Robert because Tywin figured that Robert was going to win. And during this time, uh, young 12-year-old Sander was a part of Tywin's army, and when they sacked the city, this is when Sandor killed his first his first person. He killed someone during that time. And this was when Tywin ordered his men to slaughter all the Targaryens and slaughter a lot of people. And this was when the mountain, his Gregor, his uh, uh, Sanders' older brother, uh, found his way into the the where the chambers of Prince Aegon and Princess Elia or Elia, I don't know how to pronounce her name. But anyway, the mountain killed the in, the infant Prince Aegon, son of Prince Rhaegar, which would have been the future king. So this is Prince Aegon would have been king, I think. At if so, Prince Rhaegar was going to be king after the Mad King, if I'm under, if I'm remembering right, and then Prince Aegon would have been king after Prince Rhaegar. But anyway, the mountain, under orders from Tywin, broke into the chambers and found the infant in a crib and picked him up and smashed. Okay, just a little um, trigger warning here. <laughs> There's gonna this section is gonna have some not so good stuff. So you might want to skip forward five minutes if you want to avoid this. But anyway, the mountain picks up Prince Aegon from the crib and smashes his head against the wall and instantly killing him. And then the mountain, Gregor Clegane, finds Prince Elia or Elia and rapes and then kills her. Supposedly with the infant's blood and brains still on his hands. This is all described in the book. I'm not <laughs> making this up. So if you remember right, so remember when Oberyn Martell, the viper, comes to King's Landing and Tyrion is on trial for killing, for killing Joffrey. This is 18 years later, by the way. Oberyn Martell, uh, so Tyrion says, I, I want, I want uh, to have trial by combat. And he, uh, uh, Cersei picks the mountain because the mountain is one of the most badass, uh, you know, fighters of all time. Well, then Tyrion's like, who's going to fight for me? And then Oberyn Martell steps forward and says, I'll fight for you. Not because Oberyn loves Tyrion, but because Oberyn desperately wants to kill Gregor Clegane because Gregor Clegane raped and killed his sister. You know, this is when... In the TV show and in the books, Oberyn is, during the trial by combat, he's like, Elia Martell, Princess of Dorne, you raped her, you murdered her, you killed her children. And he's just saying that over and over again. And, you know, this is a horrendous scene. This is the scene when Gregor splits Oberyn's head open like a melon. <laughs> oh, God. Um, and... All the, all the while, while he's toying with the mountain, you're just thinking, kill him. Don't give him a chance to fight back. And, of course, he doesn't uh, do that, and he does manage to fight back, and it's a terrible, terrible thing. All right. So what else can we say? Okay, so right after Robert's rebellion and Robert becomes king, Gregor and Sanders' father dies in a hunting accident, which seems like a common way to go since that's how King Robert went as well. <laughs> but there are rumors that Gregor the Mountain killed his father so he could be head of the house. But there are a lot of bad rumors about the Mountain. There were rumors that the Mountain killed their sister too. There were also rumors that the Mountain had killed his first two wives. There were also rumors that the Mountain routinely killed his servants. There were confirmed rumors that the mountain routinely raped women. 
But the other rumors could have just been for effect, and the mountain might have even liked those rumors because people, when they're afraid of you, are not as good in combat. And so it's hard to know. But I wouldn't put it past Gregor to have killed his father and his sister and his wives. And I mean, he certainly was a terrible person. But anyway, after... The, the, the father Clegane dies. This makes Gregor head of the house, which is currently still true. Now that must have not been very pleasant for Sander because before, presumably he could go to his father, you know, Sander could go to his father and say, please protect me from my brother. But now his brother's head of the house. So what does Sander do? Well, he runs away from the house and asks to be a part of the Lannister house. So here we have a, an example of how he copes with situations that are not going so well for him. He, he will run and try to join some other faction that he feels safer in, presumably, which he'll do again later, which we'll get into more in a second. Okay, so now this brings us, in terms of history, up to the times of the first book and the first episode of the TV show. He is now age about 27 or 28, and Sandor is the bodyguard of Prince Joffrey. And Joffrey calls him Dog, if you remember from the books and TV show. In the books, Cersei says that the Hound is a surrogate father for Joffrey, which I guess could have been a source of self-esteem for Sandor. He's like, well, I'm a surrogate father, that, you know... Uh, also, Sander is used to psychopaths, so S- Sander probably could handle Joffrey pretty well since Joffrey was just another psychopath like the mountain was. But Cersei might have just been saying that Sander was a surrogate father for Joffrey as a way of saying that King Robert was not a good father to Joffrey, which was true. Okay, so in the first book, in the first season... Joffrey bullies Micah, the butcher's son, if you remember this, and Arya and her dire wolf, you know, save Micah and injure, injure Joffrey. So, and Arya and the dire wolf run away and hide, and then the king sends men out to find Arya and the dire wolf, and the Lannisters send the hound to capture Micah. In the TV show... The Hound catches Micah and splits him in two. And he has some line to Eddard like, he didn't run fast enough or something like that. But anyway, for this reason, Arya, Arya Stark, later puts uh, the Hound or Sander Clegane on her list of people to assassinate. If you remember her at night, you know, saying... Uh, Gregor Clegane, blah, blah, blah. So the, just to visit that list for a second, her, her list changed over time because she would add and subtract people as time went on. But her list, her total list included Sir Gregor Clegane, but at, by the end of book five, she thinks that Gregor is dead. But in fact, Gregor is just a zombie mountain. She also had Dunson on the list for stealing Gendry's helmet, and he's still alive as far as we know. She also had Polliver for stealing Needle, her, her little sword. And Polliver was killed by the Hound in that tavern, if you remember that. I think in the TV show, she kills Polliver, but I don't remember. Okay, Chiswick. For was also on the list for his particip- participation in a gang rape. And Arya asks Jack and Hagar to kill him, and Jack and Hagar does kill him because Jack and Hagar always kills people that he says he's going to kill. <laughs> she also had Raph the Sweetling, Raph the Sweetling, for killing Lomi Green, green Hands, and Arya killed him. She also had the Tickler on the list. It's a nickname because he tortures people and she hated him and Arya killed him in that tavern when Paul ever died. She also had the Hound or Gregor Clegane on the list for killing Micah, but Arya later took him off the list because they became 
sort of friends. But then if you know she, when he, when Gregor was about to die, this is skipping forward in the story, and he's like, please, you know, put me out of my misery. Arya denies him this. So she got revenge for Micah, kind of, in the end. Arya also had Sir Armory on the list for killing Yorin, and he died randomly. She also had Sir Illyn Payne for beheading her father, but Sir Illyn Payne is still alive. She also had Sir Marin Trent on the list for killing Sirio Farrell, the, the sword dancer or water dancer. I can't remember. Uh, and Sir Marin Trent is still alive in the books, but in the TV show, Arya killed Sir Marin Trent in the brothel, if you remember that awesome scene. Arya also had Joffrey on the list for ordering the execution of her father, and we all know that Joffrey is dead, poisoned by Elena Tyrell and Peter Baelish, Littlefinger. She also has Cersei on the list for her part in her father's death, death, and at the end of book five, Cersei is still alive and kicking. And she also had Whis on the list for abusing Arya, and Arya asked Jeff uh, Jack and Agar to kill him and and he does kill him. <laughs> so Arya is on a lot of people on her list and not many of them are still alive obviously. So Cersei's still alive. Sir Marin Trent is still alive in the books. Sir Ellen Payne is still alive. And Dunson is still alive as far as... Oh, and Gregor is still, you know, kind of alive. So out of, I don't know... 10 or 12 people on her list there's there's still six people left that she has to, well she probably doesn't know Gregor's alive so she still has a number so Cersei <laughs> anyway okay getting back to Sander Clegane if you remember in the first season of the TV show in the first book there's a tourney a tournament to celebrate Eddard becoming the hand of the king and also, I think, to celebrate Sansa's betrothal to Joffrey. In this attorney, Sander is an awesome fighter, and he beats Lord Renly Baratheon, if you remember Renly. He unhorses him in, in the joust. Then Sander defeats Sir, Sir Jamie. Even, you know, he beats Jamie when he has two hands. <laughs> and Sandor... When so so when if and you remember this from the TV show when Loras Sir Loras Tyrell the Knight of Flowers is about to be killed by the Mountain, Sandor jumps in and saves Sir Loras. It's at this moment that all of Sandor's rage comes out, and he is actually trying to. They're actually trying to kill each other in this moment. But then King Robert commands the Hound to stop. And the hound immediately stops. And so this is portrayed in a TV show really well. This shows how loyal Sander is to the king. Sir Loras is super thankful, naturally, that Sander saved his life. And since he's an honorable guy, Sir Loras forfeits to Sander because Loras and, and Sander were supposed to f joust in the finals because the that was supposed to happen, but then Loras is like, I forfeit the tourney to Sander, which is, you know, good guy Loras. Loras was, you know, I like that guy. This made Sandor champion of the tourney, which is a big deal. It's like winning the Super Bowl or something. This was perhaps the first time in Sander's life that everyone was cheering for him instead of turning away from him and his disfigurement. Even Sansa the soft little Sansa was cheering for him. And I speculate that this is when Sandor and his inner heart light, like the Grinch, when the heart started to grow and grow, I think this is the moment when Sandor's heart began to grow because everyone was cheering for him. Everyone was saying what a great guy he was. He, de he defeated his, his older brother and he saved the day, and he saved the night of flowers, and everyone's cheering, and even Sansa's cheering for him. And I think that this opened his heart. Okay, so before we move on with the rest of 
this discussion. Let's take a little break. Okay, we're back from the break. If you haven't already become a patron of the podcast, do so now. Do so now. Especially if you're one of those people out there who are just sort of on the fence, like, oh, I thought I, I thought about becoming a patron, but then I was like, you know, just do it. Just do it. Just do it, man. Just do it. I'm I'm a shrink, so I know how to manipulate people through the podcast airwaves. <laughs> just go to your computer, become a patron. When when people become patrons, we all win because then we all get to dedicate more time to this little thing, this little podcast. And we got to make it better and better. And if for those of you who've been listening a long time, you know it's been getting better and better over time. And that's because we're all able to spend more time on it, which is totally because people have become patrons. So thank you so much for that. So go to patreon.com, become a patron of the podcast. Do it now. Do it now. Okay. So let's move on with Sanders' story. All right. When Eddard attempts to arrest Cersei for having uh, illegitimate children. A bunch of bad guys, including Sandor, slaughtered Eddard's men. So just know that that was happening. But it could be harder argued, if you want to be on Sandor's side, <laughs> that Sandor was just following orders like everybody else. Also... After Sir Barristan Selmy is dismissed from the Kingsguard, he's the guy who ends up with Daenerys, if you remember him, the older guy. Sir Barristan Selmy is dismissed. Joffrey re replaces Selmy with Sandor, even though Sandor is not a knight, which was the custom. So Sandor became the first bodyguard of the king, even though he's not a knight, which is interesting. Sandor is often in charge of protecting Sansa as a result, who is initially terrified of Sandor. This is why uh, I think Sandor's heart begins to even grow even more, and he becomes even more human in the story, because he is charged with really protecting Sansa. He seems to have a really have a have a soft spot in his heart for Sanda. He even tries to protect her from Joffrey's sadism, even though he is very loyal to Joffrey. And he's, in his stunted, blunt way, he is often trying to help her adjust to the cutthroat world of King's Landing by telling her that people can't be trusted and that, she, you know, everyone lies and she has to protect herself. And so here, here we have a question. We have some questions. Is this because Sandor misses his sister who died when he was a child? Is it like Sandor is trying to save his sister? Maybe he's even trying to, in a, he has a fantasy about saving his sister from his brother. And because we have a very similar situation here. As a child, he had Gregor, the sadistic person, and then his sister, who we could assume was not sadistic, and, and Sandor liked his sister and probably was often trying to save his sister from his brother. And in this situation, he has this sweet Sansa and then this sadistic Joffrey, and so he's caught in this triangle again. To me, this is when I realized in the books and in the TV show, this is when I realized that Sandor had a good heart deep down. You know, this was the first time when... Because up until this point in the story, you're just like... Sandor is a one badass cold mf -er, but uh, this is when you realize, oh, he actually does have a heart. Okay, so in the books, there's a fair amount of talking between Sandor and Sansa, so I just thought I'd give you some quotes between the two of them. In one moment, Sandor says to Sansa, killing is the sweetest thing there is, unquote. I think in the TV show, Sandor says this to Arya, but so Sanders says, killing is the sweetest thing there is. Sanders killed a lot of dudes by this point in his life. <laughs> Sandor, at another moment, says to Sansa, what do you think a knight is for, girl? So this is when Sandor is trying to disabuse Sansa of her fanciful ideas of knighthood. And remember that Sandor hates knights, and particularly because his older brother is a knight, right? Okay, so, quote, 
What do you think a night is for, a girl? You think it's all taking favors from ladies and looking fine in gold plate? Nights are for killing. I killed my first man at 12. I've lost count of how many I've killed since then. High lords with old names, fat rich men dressed in velvet, knights puffed up like bladders with their honors, yes, and women and children too. They're all meat, and I'm the butcher, unquote. <laughs> Jim and eight crickets. All right, another conversation back and forth between Sander and Sansa. Sander says, If there are gods, they made sheep so wolves could eat mutton, and they made the weak for the strong to play with. Then Sansa says, True knights protect the weak. Then Sander says, There are no true knights, no more than there are gods. If you can't protect yourself, die and get out of the way of those who can. Sharp steel and strong arms rule this world. Don't ever believe any different. Sansa, you're awful, Sandor. I'm honest. It's the world that's awful. I think this highlights just the awesome prose of George Martin. <laughs> I, I think it's, I personally, I, I'm not a writer, so I don't know, but I, I, I imagine it's sort of hard to write dialogue in this sort of world. And I think that it's one of the best things about the books. And I think why the TV show works so well, because the dialogue is, is pretty great in the TV show. But when you read the books, every paragraph has stuff like this, where you're just like, ooh, and it's just, it just, it just, it's so meaty. You know, there's so many little moments like that. Sansa, you can just sense, you know, Sansa is this innocent girl and she's, she's just like, you're awful. And Sanders like, I'm honest. It's the world that's awful. It's, it's this turn of, of, of sentiments in, I don't know how to describe, I'm not a literary critic, but I don't know. I like it. Okay. Skipping forward in the story, there's one time when uh, we see Sanders personality emerging even more. Joffrey is super pissed about the defeat during the War of Five Kings in which his uncle dies, and maybe even Jamie gets captured. But anyway, Joffrey is super pissed, and Sansa is right next to him. And so, uh, and, you know, Sansa's older brother is is ruining Joffrey's life. And Joffrey commands Sander Clegane to beat Sansa. He turns to, you know, dog, beat Sansa. And Sander didn't know what to do. And he's just sitting there in the store and you're like, oh my God, what's he going to do? Is he going to beat Sansa? He can't do that. That's that's not how this story is going. And he can't deny Joffrey. And if he does, Joffrey's going to have him killed. But Sander is saved by the bell when someone randomly threw a melon at Sansa. <laughs> So someone just, you know, some other person in the court came out of nowhere and started abusing Sansa, which distracted Joffrey. And then Joffrey commanded other men to strip Sansa naked and beat her, which they did or started to do. And then Tyrion arrived and saved everybody. And then San- Sander took his cloak off and put it on Sansa to give her, to, you know, clothe her. So we see here that Sandor has his own mind. He's starting to emerge. He is not following orders blindly anymore, all because of his fondness for Sansa. He's beginning to develop his own sense of self. He's no longer depending on masters to define who he is. Through his empathy for Sansa, he is finding his inner strength and his inner identity. Throughout his life, he is being abused to the point where he doesn't have time or the space to think about who he is. And then his, uh, and then in this moment, his brother isn't around, so he's a little freer to decide. And he's had a lifetime of gaining his own power. And then he has empathy for Sansa, and this, you know, grows his heart, <laughs> so to speak. All right. Moving forward in the story, as Stannis' army is approaching King's Landing, and it's thought by all the people that Stannis is going to win, the people in King's Landing, the common folk, are starting to freak out, naturally. And also, there's not enough food to go around, because I think Tyrion was 
rationing the food so that the army could be fed or so I can't remember, but the common people, they riot when King Joffrey and others are walking in public. And in the confusion, Sansa is pulled from her horse and nearly raped and killed, but Sandor saves the day. And we see that in the TV show too. Moving forward in the story, when Stannis' army attacks King's Landing during the Battle of the Blackwater, Sandor is one of the key commanders who pushed back Stannis and his army. But when Tyrion uses wildfire to blow up all the ships, Sandor's PTSD is triggered and he freaks out, naturally. He runs away from the battle, even though Tyrion is commanding him to stay. At this point, I think this is a crossroads for Sander. Sander's like, I, I, I used to be, I used to identify as a loyal hound. I used to serve my master, but then this sweet Sansa came into my life, and I have empathy for her, just like my sister that I that I used to have, and that you know possibly my older brother killed her, and now I have a chance to to save the girl and do something good in this world. And I can't do that by being the loyal hound anymore. It's been a lifetime of me being loyal and serving others, but I I can't stand serving these sadistic assholes all the time. And I don't care about knighthood, and I don't care about the ladder of society. So, and here I am in this Battle of Blackwater, and there's fire all around me. I can't trust this world to protect me from the things that I'm afraid of. And he probably even thinks that more wildfire is going to be used, right? Because he's like, you know, okay, here's wildfire again. We haven't seen that in a while. And is it going to be used again? Uh, This is no good for my life. So again, he could he could have decided, decided to stay and continue his, you know, somewhat glamorous life as the king's number one guard. But if he left, if he decided to go a different route, where would he go? He would be a hunted man if he left, right? Because he would, it's like treason or not treason, but abandoning your post is probably, you know, death to someone in his position. And... It, he he has an inkling to save Sansa from Joffrey, and so he he's probably I mean, again I'm just taking all these guesses. This is a fictional character, so it doesn't really exist. But <laughs> if he did exist, he's probably sitting there thinking, "Okay, wildfire, I'm out of here. That's the fi- that's the straw that broke the camel's back. I'm I'm out of here." And he runs away from the battle. Tyrion's yelling at him. And he's think uh, he's thinking he's thinking two things. I think at this point, I'm going to get drunk, which he does because that's what a lot of people do when they have a trauma reaction, a fight or flight reaction. You often drink to calm the nerve or to numb yourself from the pain and the distress that you feel. But the second thing he's thinking is, I'm leaving. I'm getting out. I'm going to get the f out of here, and I want to save Sansa. But if I save Sansa from Joffrey, where am I going to take her? So he's thinking, okay, I'll. I'll I'll take, I'll rescue Sansa and I'll bring her to Rob Stark, the King of the North. Presumably, I could even serve Rob instead of Joffrey. I heard Rob is a good guy and Joffrey is a terrible person. So, in the middle of the battle, he runs away, he finds booze, gets drunk to soothe his distress, which is common for people with PTSD. Then he hides in Sansa's room. And when Sansa comes into her room, he emerges from the shadows, which freaks her out, and asks her to come with him to the north. But she refuses. Now, this is... Uh, people get angry at Sansa at this moment. It's like, just go with Sander. <laughs> you should go with him. But mind you, she's 13 at the time, so she's very young. She's, enga- she's engaged to marry the king of Westeros, which is a big deal, right? <laughs> um, I've seen people go through much worse things for much less on Survivor TV show. So it's not unheard of to say, well, yeah, my life sucks, but I'm going to be queen of everything. (laughs) And then you are in the middle of this battle of the Blackwater and you're not, and you're not sure how things are going to go. And then all of a sudden this drunken, horrifying monster emerges from the shadows and asks you to come with him North. 
So I think she's ambivalent, but she says no. And in his sadness or something, Sandor asks her to sing him a song. And she's freaking out, and she just sings this random song for him. And then Sandor rips off his king's guard cloaks, throws it on the ground, and leaves. And after Sandor leaves, uh, Ari, or not, not Arya, Sansa misses Sandor, and she keeps his cloak, his bloody cloak, because he was in the battle killing people, so there's blood all over it. She has his bloody his bloody cloak in a chest that she secretly keeps and sometimes looks at as a, as a way of remembering Sandor and missing him. So Sandor heads north, and Sandor is captured by the Brotherhood without banners. This is when Sandor meets Arya, who was also captured by the Brotherhood, if you remember. They put, the Brotherhood puts Sandor on trial for being a bad person and killing a bunch, a bunch of people, but they don't have enough evidence, so they decide to let the gods decide by having him do the trial by combat, another trial by combat. You know, it's believed that if if you have trial by con- combat, the gods will make sure that the innocent person wins. And so Sander is made to fight Sir Beric, or Lord Bar- Beric, or anyway, Beric Dondarrion. And they say if Sander wins, then the gods are saying that Sander is innocent. Now, normally Sandor would easily kill Beric, but Beric pulls out a flaming blade, which again triggers uh, Sandor's PTSD. And uh, Sandor has a tougher time, but Sandor wins anyway, and then Ber- and kills Beric Dondarrion, but Beric Dondarrion is brought back to life, and they let Sandor go after taking all his money, <laughs> uh, you know, for the cause of the Brotherhood Without Banners. Sandor later kidnaps Arya so he can ransom her f- to Rob Stark and maybe even work for Rob Stark. And everyone knows where Rob Stark will be. Rob Stark will be at the Twins with the Freys for the wedding of Edmure Tur- Tully and Rosalind Frey. So Sans- Sandor and Arya set off for the Twins. And Arya at this point hates Sandor and thinks he's a monster, but at the same time, she's like, well, I'm going to be reunited with my brother, so great. Uh, time passes, and they arrive just in time for the Red Wedding, and Rob's men are all getting drunk. King Rob, you know, King of the North, Rob's, all the Stark men are getting drunk because there's a wedding for Edmure Tully. And the Frey's men, the evil Frey's men, are staying sober, and then they win the signal goes, they slaughter Rob Stark, Rob Stark's wife, Rob Stark's mother, and all the others. The They also uh, kill all the uh, Northmen you know, soldiers. And the Freys also try to kill Sandor and Arya. But Sandor fights back and kills a bunch of them, and they get away. And so they set off for the Vale to ransom Arya to Lysa Aaron, the Moondor lady, if you remember her because Lysa Aaron is related to Arya. It's Arya's aunt. So this is where the books and the TV show branch off in terms of the story of Sandor Clegane. In the books, Sandor and Arya never reach the Vale because the path to the Vale is closed from snow, I think. And so they head off to one of Arya's, uh, a different uh, Arya relative, relatives, uh, one of the Tullys in the Riverlands. And when they go to a tavern while Sandor is getting drunk because he's drinking more and more, I'm guessing due to his PTSD, they encounter some of Gregor's men and they fight. And Arya participates in this fight. Sandor gets seriously injured. And after a while, after after the fight, Sandor realizes he's going to die. And he sits down underneath a tree and he asks Arya to kill him in mercy, but she refuses and leaves him to die slowly, just like the TV show. In the TV show, it's a little different. They actually arrive at the Vale and learn that Lysa had just died. So once again, they arrive too late, and that's when Arya laughs hysterically. <laughs> and then they run into Brienne, who was looking for Arya. So this never happens in the books. Brienne and Sandor mistakenly think that they're enemies, and so they fight, 
This is one of my favorite scenes in the TV show. The fight is amazing. Sometimes I'll just Google this fight and watch it for fun. It's just so awesome. I've never seen a fight scene quite like this one. And as you know, Brienne wins and Sandor is mortally wounded and falls off a cliff. And at the bottom of the cliff, he's dying and, a, and he asks Arya for a mercy killing and she refuses, which is another great scene in the TV show. Okay, so there are rumors in the books that the Hound is still alive. Now, in the TV show, we know that by season six, we know that he somehow survived his wounds and became a peaceful dude working with a bunch of hippies. And then some bad dudes killed all the hippies, and then Sandor joins the Brotherhood. To, uh, but in the book, it, there's all these rumors about this guy in the Hound Helm going around killing all these people. And there's rumors that the Brotherhood found him. And then there's another part of the of book five in which a man tells Brienne that he personally witnessed the death of the Hound. So he came upon, after Arya left, this man, I think a priest of some sort, came upon the Hound and saw him die and then buried him and then left his helm on top of his grave. And then this man surmises that someone stole the helm and is using it to scare people. And then later in the story, but at this point you're thinking, well, maybe maybe the hound is still alive. But then Brienne finds a dude who is wearing Sandor's helm, and this confirms that it's just an imposter. But so just as you think, okay, the chapter of Sandor Clegane is over, There are additional hints that Sandor might be alive somewhere. It's hard to tell. I personally think that George Martin has killed Sandor in the story, but he wants to keep some rumors about him being alive. And then the fans, of course, want Sandor to be alive. And so everyone's sort of reading into it to to find that he's still alive. Now, the fact that he came back to life in the TV show indicates that George Martin actually might have signed off on that because that might be a storyline in the future, but I don't know. Uh, so, so let's speculate about the future of, of Sandor Clegane, the hound, uh, moving forward into books six and seven and moving forward into seasons seven and eight. Uh, now some people hate it when people speculate about the future, but I'm here to tell you that I'm almost always wrong when I speculate about the future of characters. So, Don't worry about anything being spoiled because I I often am really bad at predicting where writers are going to go with things. But for for me, I think that in the books, I think George Martin will keep him a mystery. That's the sort of thing that George Martin would do. But maybe George will have him with the Brotherhood, which would make sense because these men are, you know, basically good, but they reject all that knighthood stuff, just like Sander does. And the Brotherhood can bring people back from the dead, so there's that. But I think, ultimately, George Martin's going to leave him as a mystery. There's just too many other characters to focus on in, in, in books six and seven. So, I don't know. Now, in the TV show, I think Sandor is going to have an epic storyline, just like you know, Cersei and Jon Snow and all the others because they wouldn't have wasted precious time on him in season six if he was just going to be a minor player in seasons seven and eight. So if I was to speculate, I would predict that he and the rest of the Brotherhood are going to join forces with Jon Snow, which would bring Sandor back back, uh, to Sansa And if the TV writers really wanted to make it epic, Sandor will sacrifice himself for Sansa somehow to save her life or something. And if the TV writers wanted to make it super epic, they would have him die while he's fighting his brother, the mountain zombie. (laughs) Or maybe Arya will somehow meet up with Sandor and they'll ride off into the sunset together so they can have fun adventures killing people who deserve to be killed. I don't know. There are so many possibilities. We'll see. All right. What can I say about his personality? Well, as, as a young boy, 
he, as I said before, he was probably like anyone else. He was probably, he had the same disposition as anybody else. He was probably nice and optimistic and all those things. But his brother's sadism and intimidation and abuse and terribleness made him not trust other people. And, and you know, particularly bur- burning his face off. And this burnt face was a constant reminder of the way in which his brother abused him and made him feel weak and small. So this was probably, you know, very important in his personality development. And if he didn't have an older brother like this, you just have to wonder what his personality would have been like. Also, Sander likely suffered from PTSD. There's not a ton of evidence of that in the story, but there's definite indications of it. Because aggression can be a symptom of PTSD. I, I once had a client who, in my early career who really taught me this. He, he, he was 18, 19, and had been abused as a child and abandoned. And in his teenage years, he got into a lot of trouble, naturally, given his history. And he said that when he got into fights with people... He loved it. I, I remember. I remember. I just was asking in this non-judgmental way. Just you know, tell me more. What do you mean you love it? You know, what what is it about it that you love? And and trying to just listen to him. And I'll never forget. He said, "When I punch people and like other b- boys in the face, it's like time slows down, and I can see the blood spurting out of their mouth as I punch them or out of their nose." And it's, and it's just the best feeling in the world just to see another person's face being bashed in. As a young person, and you know, I'm 27 at the time, I was terrified by this. I just thought, oh my God. But as I started to learn more about humans and trauma, I learned that this is a way of coping with trauma. When you're abused, you have a number of coping mechanisms. You can decide to become passive and you can internalize all of your issues and become depressed and anxious. Another option available to you is you can externalize all of your anger and pain and you can take it out on other people and you can become aggressive as a way of dealing with things. And this is how the cycle of abuse just perpetuates because each time you abuse a child, they grow up, they have children, they have a greater likelihood of abusing their children. And then, you know, the cycle just continues. Having said that, not everyone who's abused abuses their children. That's silly, but, but uh, that's how the cycle, you know, perpetuates itself. So the idea is, is that Sandor was abused by his brother. And, and, Later on in life, he suffered from PTSD. And when he would have his PTSD triggered, he basically has the classic four options. He can fight, he can flight, he can freeze, or he can appease. And long ago, he learned that running or freezing or appeasing didn't work. So he fought in response to being triggered. And he was a good fighter. So it was... A self, uh, it was a source of self esteem and power for him to fight. And so when he was triggered, he would fight. And he made sure that he was good at fighting, which he was. But PTSD is, is more complicated than that. And there's, it's not, it's not, it's a very, it's a very distressing condition. When someone's PTSD is triggered, people feel awful. They're very distressed for a long period of time. They feel, their nervous system is in a state that that it's it does not feel good. It's like walking around in a constant state of fight or flight without any remedy, without anything to run away from, without anything to fight, and it doesn't feel good. And alcohol is a common source of comfort in that situation. And Sandor definitely drank a lot to cope with his symptoms, particularly after the Battle of Blackwater, in which he experienced this explosive uh, wildfire. And this drinking ultimately did him in because if he had been sober for his final battle, in the books anyway, he might have survived it. Okay, 
another thing we can say about his personality. In the TV show, when he bumps into Brienne, his lack of trust results in him getting into a fight with her. You know, if he had just slowed down and if he had listened to Brienne, he would have realized that she could be trusted and that she was on his side. They could have joined up together. Imagine that. Brienne and Podrick and and uh, Arya and Sandor. Uh, they could have all traveled the countryside together and eventually met up with with Rob. That would have been rad. But because Sandor's abusive childhood, it made it very difficult for him to trust anyone, particularly people who were powerful. So he likely transferred his issues with his older brother onto Brienne in that moment. And so he chose to fight her instead. And it just makes you sad for Sanders' end, particularly in a TV show, you know? He's really a tragic character. The last thing I'll say about his personality is, again, as I've been talking about, the only people who managed to get him to open up were Sansa and Arya. This points to a possible relationship with his sister that we don't know anything about. But again, his sister died when he was very young. And whether or not Gregor, his older brother, killed his sister, I'm guessing that Gregor was at least abusive to her and that Sander the Hound felt bonded to her and wanted to protect her. So he likely transferred all of his issues with his sister onto Sansa and Arya. Sansa and Arya were the only two people who managed to get him to open up, who managed to get him to be a human being and helped him to develop his own sense of self. When he was suffering during the Battle of Blackwater, when all the wildfire was freaking him out, where did he go? Well, he went to Sansa's room and he went to Sansa and he said, let's, let's go together. I can save you from this terrible place called King's Landing. When he was suffering with his wounds and about to die, what did he do? He begged Arya to put him out of his misery. And tragically, both Sansa and Arya rejected him in these moments. It's, it just makes me sad to think about that. He's truly a tragic character, right? Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. I'm going to do more episodes on Game of Thrones, so look out for that. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really deserve care from others and from yourself.